Hey, John. Hey, how's it going? It's not going good. Oh, no. Am I on here twice? No, I don't know. Oh. Huh. Um, yeah, it's not going good. Oh, that's rough. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear about that. Um, I no, just... it's not about that. It's oh, about yeah? Working on... Uh, you know what I'm working on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, they, it's not working. Yeah, you're talking about DFFML, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. That's that's yeah. no fun. I ran into the same problem at my on my work machine, one of my work machines, uh, last week. Um, I just switched to using a different machine because <laughs> it was completely hosed. I have no idea. I tried reinstalling everything several times. Uh, I just I have no idea what's wrong. Uh, but yeah. So did you have you tried? Let's see. I was thinking maybe you could share your screen and we could go through it um, here to see what's up, and then we'll try to document that because I'm sure if you ran into it and I ran into it, somebody else is going to run into it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at some yeah. point, right? Like it doesn't seem to happen right away. It's like at some point it just gets hosed. Okay. Uh... Application. Okay, here, I'll stop sharing my screen here. Oh, is my screen? How's it going? Is my screen visible? Uh, yes. Okay, so uh, I tried this with like a Docker too. Here. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's still not working. It throws the same error everywhere I try it. Wow, what is up with that? Hmm. Okay. So. Wow, it's really weird that it happens in Docker too. Um, no repos to train on. Okay. Um, What could be up here? Oh, did you try doing that git clean command? Uh, yeah, I tried it in, in Docker itself. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really matter where you do it. Uh, I tried it. But yeah, if you do the git clean and then you reinstall, then that's... I did uh, git clean xdf and then I reinstalled it. It still yeah. didn't work. Okay, so because... Okay, yeah, so then I guess in this case, let's not try that again. How's it going, Agen? Oh, yeah, so we got Agen and uh, we got Himanshu on here as well. Um, we're going through Sakshams, um issue right now with the development environment. It's like something something seems to be amiss here um, because he can't train, can't train the model. It's saying that there's no repos in the source. Um, but I can do it on my machine. I can do it in my Docker container, but he can't do it in his Docker container, which is really weird. Um, so maybe again can help because he wrote the TensorFlow model. Oh yeah. Well, this is the. I think this is the classifier. Actually, I wrote this one. Um, okay. But so it's my fault then. <laughs> um, so let's see. Like, but. Try machine if I see. I'll see if it works. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So basically what we're doing here, yeah, maybe if somebody else can pull down your branch and try it, that would be good. And that way we'll see, because it seems to be working for me, So, but I also have weird setups on things, right? So uh, let's see, Intel slash DFFML pulls. Hmm. <laughs> okay, so... I will just paste this into Gitter here. Um, let's see. Okay. Actually, it looks like the source test... Oh, the source test is failing because of the entry point stuff that got updated. Um, yeah, I tried it in Git port. The entry point error was showing. Okay. Okay. You know, let's see. Um, 
So you tried it in Gitpod and it didn't work too. Actually, uh, let's try. That's interesting. So it's throwing the cannot import entry point. Yeah. Okay. So it, okay. Um, let me get a shell here. All right. I think what I'm going to try to do is before anybody pulls this guy down. I know I just pasted it, but before anybody pulls this guy down, let me try to merge master into it. Um, and then, and that way, um, you know, we'll have that entry point stuff fixed. Um, so, cd documents python dffml. Oh, I think I'm already on this branch. Yes, I am. All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to pull it down. I'm going to verify it works here for me. Let me share with you guys real quick so you guys can see what's going on over here. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing, and then we're all going to do the same thing just to make sure everything works. So git fetch origin. So I'm going to merge it. I'm going to push it up, and then merge... Gosh. Oh, Jesus. Okay. All right. Let's just see how this goes then. So, oh, um, all right. So, where are we? I'll just go. So we got to do cd source idx. So let's just run it here real quick, make sure everything's good to go. Um, no module name coverage. Oh, this is my broken computer. That's what I was just talking about. All right. Okay. Here we go. Source IDX. So get fetch origin. Oh, I gotta do it over here. Merge squash origin master. Alright, All right, here we go. This one was already set up. So source IDX, let's see what happens. Oh, I'm already here. Set it up. Test. Oh, yeah, we got to fix the entry points. Okay, so let me fix the entry points. And then I'll push it up. And then we'll all make sure that this is correct. Because... It should, we should make sure it works in the CI. If it works in the CI, then it's definitely a problem with your machine. But, okay, God, why does it not work in the Docker container? That's weird. Um, okay, error. What could be wrong with the Docker container? Um, oh, there's no attribute read right. Oh, that's right, we changed that. Uh, oh yeah, all the file sources need this now. So, read write equals false. Allow, what was it? Uh, allow, uh, allow oh, empty. 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 Yeah. All right, great, yeah. So let's get this here. Okay, and this one takes longer. Great. Okay, 
So now if you guys want to try those commands to pull it down, um, we can see if that works on everybody else's system. So I'll post up this guy here too. And then why don't you also try to pull that down, Sakshom, and uh, let's see, we'll watch your screen and see if that works there. And then I'll watch the CI test too here. Uh, let's see. Okay, and then I'm going to think about what could be going wrong with the Docker container. Hmm. Is this Windows? What are you running here? Or is this... uh, it's Linux. I changed it a bit. This is cool. I I I took like two or three days to modify it. Oh yeah, nice. So, to to look at the same as Windows. Yeah, it looks good. Thank you. Okay, uh, have you pushed it? Yeah, I pushed it up. Okay, let's see what yeah, style checks not passing. Alright, okay, so let's see. Let's can you do a get status? Let's just make sure. Or I guess that doesn't here, can you do a get log, sorry. Okay, update with allow empty rewrite. Okay, sweet. So it looks we should be in the right place here. Alright. Um yeah, so I guess try running the test then. Uh, on the on the uh, top directory. Uh, on the IDX3 source. Um, so CD source IDX3, or yeah, IDX, yeah, and then try test. Okay, I guess this is just the source test, but yeah. We gotta make sure this works. Okay, it's gotta download that file. Yeah, all right. Okay, looking good so far. The source works. So let me, I'm gonna retry. I just realized I didn't try that train command again. So let me try that. At docs, usage, mnist, okay. The tests are working. All right, great. Okay, so now CD back into the main directory there. Um, uh, let's see, I'm getting an error here now, actually. Entry point not found. Let's see. I wonder if you're going to get the same entry point not found error. Yeah, label yeah. was not found. That's weird. What happened? Did we switch the... Because it's... I mean, that's the source it's trying to load there. Um, oh, no. Entry point not found is because of the classification command. Because um, it doesn't have colons in it, so it's trying to load it. So that's... Which is... We need to get rid of that. But I think... Uh, I can't remember what his name is. The other Yash is, is going to work on that, I think. Um, so let's see. So we just need to add like uh, next to, oh, and actually I think it changed the model predict anyways, didn't it? Or no, you have that in your pull request, which is still open. Um, um, again, that's, I think that's still open. So classification, um, so if you change the model classification parameter to be label colon int colon one, and actually, check this out. Do Control X, Control E. Control X. Or Control X and then E. With the up arrow first. Let's see. I wonder if it'll work for you. Yeah. Yeah. So that opens your thing in the editor. Sometimes it's easier to fly around there. I just somebody just told me this, so I thought I would share. Um, so That's label uh, model. Wait, you went too far, I think. So 
uh, yeah, so label, and then uh, what's a and flavor? then yeah, it should be model classification label, uh, then colon int colon one. Let's see. Oh, and we also have to change the defs. So we have to get rid of, uh, in front of image, there's a def colon, or model features, it's def colon image, and we have to get rid of that because that merged in. Okay, okay. Let's see. Okay, so far so good over here. Yeah, things look okay for me over here. Let's see what happens. Um... And I'll update those docs pages. Or... Okay. Yeah, and then if you just exit the editor, it'll run the command. Let's see. Looking good, looking good. Fingers crossed. Oh, that, no, no, no. Oh, come on! What the hell? <laughs> Hey, hey, what the fuck is going on here? Um, what the hell? What the fuck? Okay, the only thing I can think of at this point is the hash values of those files are incorrect. What happens if you do SHA-384 sum space uh, train images IDX3 U-byte? Uh, can you repeat that? So do SHA-384 sum all one word and then space and then one of those file names or both of the file names both the train file names you just use train hyphen star uh wait they start with train so just do train hyphen star and then hit enter okay so let's see now we gotta just check i gotta we gotta check the so within this source, we we have a test case, right? We have that test that was added that does the hash validation. Um, oh, no, those are correct. Let's see. Yeah, check out the test case there under tests. Yeah. Uh, up, up, up. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, open that guy. So these scroll down a bit. Um, and uh, okay, so these hashes should match if it's the right file data. Well, I guess it is. Uh, I mean, it. Uh, yeah, just make sure those hashes match, basically. Seven. Uh, yeah, the match. They match. What the hell could be the wrong here? Um, I guess what what happens if you look in the. Um, okay. What happens if you look in DFFML sources or source source py? Okay, yeah, and then just uh, scroll all the way down here. Okay, so yeah, okay, so the other source, and that's all good there. Repo merge self one other source. Huh. Can you try printing out, um, do like a, right above that if validation is none or if validation repo. Do I'll print this, right? Yeah, actually, wait, do, do above that because I don't think the validation is true. So do like a... No, it's not. I tried it. Okay. Yeah. So what it's happens... Not. Yeah, what's up? Okay, what is up with this? All right, let's do, let's do, um... Like right above that, make a new line right above that if statement um, at the same indentation level. Yeah, and do just like print repo.features and call the features method. Um, so repo.features, open paren, close paren. Um, and then, let's see. Yeah, so uh, parentheses, sorry, not brackets. There you go. So let's just, just look at that and see what happens. Um, we're probably going to get a whole lot of crap, so you're going to have to control C it or something. But just like wait until it starts printing massive stuff. Um, okay. 
Okay, yeah, control C or whatever. <laughs> okay, so it looks like it's not merging correctly. Like that other file is not getting in there because there's only yeah, the yeah. image. I, I wanted to tell you this, but my uh, my uh, command was not working, so I thought if it works, then I'll see to it what's happening. Yeah, so this is weird because uh, what the hell? Um. Okay, so this is very odd. Why is why is yours not loading the file and mine is loading the file? Let's see. Can we go back to your command line where you ran the train command and look at what your train command is? I copied it from what you wrote in the guitar chat. Yeah. Okay. So train labels. Okay. Images, source, images, source, images, feature. Okay, let's see. Let me just let me just copy paste over this one that I just ran, and then we can make sure that we're definitely running the same thing here. Um, um, okay. Mm. Uh, why is my screens being weird? Sorry. Okay. Um. Sorry, I was trying to copy paste something. It didn't work. All right. Um. Let's see. Yeah, console. All right, just try that now. And uh, could, did you guys, were, can you guys pull down that branch, everybody else, and see if this works? Yeah, I'm okay. Okay, and it looks like... Yeah, I tried pulling, but I'm getting a complex. Oh, you're getting complex. Oh, you probably need to stash your changes or something. You probably want to. Um, okay. might. Yeah, you might have unstaged changes or something. Um, it's giving the same no repos to trainer. Okay. Uh, damn. Why would it be doing that? Let's see. It's not. I mean. IDX three source, IDX one source. We have the same code. Why is it doing this? Um, Yours is working. Yeah, it works over here. I can show you again. Um, yeah, so I'll just copy paste it from here. But yeah, if I use this command. This is what happens. Turn source. Do you get that? Oh, maybe. Let's see. Ignored log. Ignored model. Ignored sources. Do you get those yeah, lines? This, uh, I wasn't getting them before. The I pulled down the changes. Or okay. I changed the CLS. Okay, and now I see it's doing the training here. So. It, gets the model or it gets the yeah it gets all the data here because it it goes and it says we're using 60,000 columns worth of data um after the training on features image it uh, throws yeah, an error in there. Train, yeah and yours throws an error there yeah hmm and so but, but clearly your everything that's coming through like they don't it, we saw when we printed it out like it's not getting combined correctly there um, you can also try that command and see uh, uh, the print statement if uh, if it if it's combining in your. Well, mine is combining because it's getting through here, um, and it wouldn't you know it wouldn't it wouldn't train unless it's combining. Um, so, I think maybe just try. Uh, um, 
So what happens if you try this in Gitpod? But I'll try it in Gitpod too. And then did any, if anybody else pulled it down, let us know if that worked. So let's see. Git, gitpod.io slash All right, so we'll just we'll just wait for this to start up, and let's jump to somebody else for now, um, and see if we can loop back on this while you try it in Gitpod. Um, you're gonna need to figure out how to like add your branch, and uh, you know you'll need to do like Git remote add um, and stuff to add your branch and then pull it down. Um, but yeah, okay. So let's see. Um, okay, so who else? Who else is on the call here? Um, I think we have somebody new. Uh, I don't recognize. Um, I can't see your whole name. Sorry. Oh, he's gone now. He was a ninja. Yeah, yeah, I just thought. Yeah, I think it was Shobon. Okay. Is that? Um, it might have been this guy. Oh, you guys can't see my screen, can you? Oh no, you can. Okay. Um. Anyways, yeah, so how are you guys doing? Um, Agan and I have been working uh, uh, furiously on that, uh, <laughs> on the uh, uh, data flow stuff over there. Um, so I think we're... Hey, I have one doubt, like, uh, how do you know what function runs when you enter a CLA command? Oh, how do you know what function runs? Okay, so... Actually, I was just writing this stuff down, so this will be good. Um, I just started to document stuff about the code based. Um, and so if you guys, let's see. If you guys want to add um, things to this area here, basically. So I, I changed the, the contributing.md to, um, I put it on the website to make it a little more consistent since the rest of the documentation is there. Um, and I added this section about like code base layout and notes. So, and this is like a lot of stuff, you know, that, that we're, that I'm super familiar with and you guys are various levels are familiar with now, like in different areas. Um, so uh, basically what I did is I just outlined the fact that, you know, we're plug, everything's plugin based. Um, plugins are in their respective directories. And then I outlined that I, I put a note about the double context entry pattern. Um, because I know that that's like a common thing that is, it's, that's new. Um, so, and then the other thing was what I wanted to do was write some more notes about the various subsystems and it's like, okay, like this is what we're doing with sources and, and here's how the, here's how you, you, you know, here's some tips and tricks, right? And here's some things you got to watch out for. And here's, you know, the way you run some test cases and stuff like that for the respective, uh, plugins as, as you run into them. Um, so basically like if you think of things where it's like, oh, I wish I wish I uh, I keep copy pasting this or something. Like you might want to write it in here, um, and we'll just add it to the main documentation. But so on this note of how do CLI commands work, this is something that would go here, right? Like how does the CLI work? And the answer is um, so the answer on this one. Check out. Master. Oh well, this is up to date with master now. So let me make the text a little bigger here. So the CLI stuff is basically like there's this wrapper around arg parse, which is the standard parsing library from the standard argument parsing library from uh, Python, right? Um, where is the dam? Okay. Um, and sorry. Um, okay. And so. Equals, sorry, I'm having a hard time typing and talking. Okay, so if you look in dffml util cli and you look at command.py, this is sort of like the mastermind behind it all. Um, okay, and I'm going to preface this by saying this is so that we can tie in with like the arg parse argument parsing and stuff, and then like it does some output formatting so that. Basically, I don't know if, if you guys, if you return anything from a CLI command, it'll just get JSON dumped. Um, and that's because so many things understand JSON that like if you're running this as a subprocess or you know you might be running it from PHP or something, you can just JSON load the input back in and then you know you don't have to do a bunch of parsing. Um, 
so but the way the way that it works is we've got this abstraction layer around uh, around art parse where similar to like how there's all these classes with their config objects um this is from before that um so it's all it's uh, eventually what we should do is is con consolidate that code those code bases so that um we use we we can make we just like assign a config object and that would be like all of the arguments that go to this thing but this is all holdovers because it hasn't gotten you know it hasn't gotten updated to use that more clean way of doing it um so the way that it works is you basically say you derive from this command class and you implement the run method um so and what this allows us to do is um it, it makes it really easy to write commands that have similar arguments without rewriting a bunch of code. Um, and that's why it works this way. So if we look at like DFFML, CLI, um, ML.py. So um, let me open DFFML utils uh, commands. Uh, so there's like a couple commands in this commands file that basically like make it easier for any time you do something with sources you would just like derive from this subclass that has the sources and then it's already filled out this arg and if you guys have seen uh, i can't remember how long everybody's been around but if you saw the args and config methods um you would know that you have to redefine all these every time you use a, a class that has the same type you would have to like put in this arg structure and say okay like i want to use this argument that's of type source and you know basically do all the arg parse stuff for it so that it could come in from the command line or it could come in from somewhere else and get parsed correctly um and so once again this is all kind of holdover stuff and the reason why it's all like this subclass based a little bit of a mess here is because then you could just say okay i need something that uh uses source and it uses a model and all you have to do is basically just subclass uh use two base classes right um and now anytime you need a uh a command that does machine learning stuff you can now just derive from ml command which is just a combination of something that uses a model and something that uses a source and uh i think something that uses a model Okay, yeah, it used to have more, it used to have a lot more arguments, but as we've consolidated this config stuff, it's all kind of like, you know, become under the, the object, the main configurable objects themselves and not the uh, CLI commands. Um, does that make any sense so far? Yeah, yeah so far. Yeah. Okay, cool. And so, and if you want to see what it, I mean, this is what they actually look like, right? They basically just say, okay, I'm a train command. Right, this is the train command, and then where's the run method? It's kind of, it's this is the same way that the uh, operations work, is they implement a run method, and that op decorator actually just creates a class with a run method that is the function that we're decorating, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So it basically just inserts the, the method, the function that you're decorating into the run method of the operation. Um, and so then within the run method, you just do whatever you need to do, right? So in this case, we basically say, okay, enter the sources, enter the main context of the source, enter the main context of the model, check out the source context, check out the model context, and then run, run the, the train, train right? Um, accuracy, very similar. Predict uh, gets a little weird. But basically, the way that you tell how, uh, what, what command gets run is by... So if you look in cli.cli, this is the main class that does, this is the main entry point for this command line interface. And if you define, like you've seen over here, if we define like an arg, like arg underscore log, and then you say, okay, what is this argument? That'll end up in the self.log property of the class. So that was another thing to make it easier so that you basically, you say, what are my arguments? And then within the run method, you just can access them with self.whatever. And it, it simplified writing these commands very greatly, right? Um, so then if you want something that's not an argument, but is like a sub command, you just say, what is the property equals something that derives from command, right? And so then if I say, um so if i say dffml it's going to just print out these are all the sub commands right which is what we're seeing over here um and then uh if, so if i say like dffml um train 
help. Uh, it'll it knows about the model and it knows about the source, which is above here, um, because they're both you know it's a double. Uh, it, yeah, yeah. Um, polymorphic or whatever that is, right? Um, and so the issue with this becomes that. Um, all these very nested config options aren't really captured. We could capture them, um, but the problem becomes like, okay, so we have all these different models. Um, then this was originally one of the things that happened. It's basically like, okay, I wanted to list out all the different command line options for all the different models. Well, then I need to load the models, look at their configs, um, and then print them all out in some kind of reasonable format. And the result of that, especially after adding yeah, the SciK yeah, models, it yeah, it would become this massive, massive thing. And I don't know if you guys have ever used like Docker or Docker machine, but they hit that problem and you would dump their help message and it's like, whoa, it's like 400 lines long. It's insane because they did the same sort of thing where they have these plugins and the plugins have different options. It's a mess. So that's why it's all on the docs website. Um, so, but yeah, this is how you figure out what CLI command is getting run. So if you do dffml train, that becomes the train command. And like if we're looking at the data flow stuff, dffml data flow, um, then the data flow is actually imported from, uh, let's see, where's it? I'll open it here. So dffml CLI data flow. So the data flow commands are all defined above here. Right, okay, that's the display one. So run repos is, this is the run command, and then you can do it on the set, or you can do it on all of them. And if you, the reason why these have an underscore in front of them is because set and all are keywords in Python, right? Um, they're built-in functions, and so, so therefore, if you want to define a subcommand with a built-in function as a name, you can just preface it with an underscore. Um, and so obviously this is all the type of thing that needs to be documented, um, which is why I started writing that little code notes thing. And actually this might go under the notes for subsystems, but this is all actually stuff that needs to change long-term because we have that existing config infrastructure and those like auto args and config methods that can extrapolate from any class that's decorated with that at config method. Um, so we really should try to reduce the amount of like double parsing code that, of arguments that's going on here, which should be should be pretty doable. Um, just need to go do it, right? Um, but yeah, uh, let's see. Does that answer your questions enough on how this works? Or is there something you'd like to hear a little more about? while we're talking about it. Again. It was Agen. Yeah, I think we might have lost him. Hey, Agen. Hello? Hey. I think we lost you for a second Hello. there. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I no, just... I I that... still hear you. Am I microphone? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Does that is that answer your questions on that, or do you want yeah, to hear a little yeah, more? Yeah, okay. Does, yeah. Cool. So yeah. let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, so about uh, this thing, uh, like when we use merge, we won't need run data flow, right? Um. So when what? Like uh, now we are planning to merge both of those data flows, right? Yeah. So we won't be using the run data flow method. So, actually, um, like at least for now, right? Yeah. So, okay. So here's the thing, actually, and you just made me realize something having uh, outlined the uh, stuff about uh, the command line. Um, so if we go to the docs um, and we go to the usage examples, data flow deployment, combining operations. So this is the example of. Right, we took one data flow, we tagged on this other data flow here to the side, we made them one, we merged them, right? And okay. so the way that this worked is we basically just said dffml data flow merge, and then we piped that to the data flow diagram command, and we said, okay, your data flow is coming from standard in. Um, what I had been trying to say was that we could uh, implement. Like in the run command, yeah. uh, you have multiple data flows. Yeah, and you, yeah, basically implement the functionality of the merge and the run command. But now what I'm realizing looking at this is 
we, we don't, don't have to do that. We can just uh, we can just run yeah, the merge command and it. pipe. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> uh, I'm glad we realized that. So that's good. Um, so okay. Yeah. So I think then in that case. Um, but this is the thing, right? So we we were talking about and and we were talking about how uh, you, you did you understand? I think it. I feel like I remember seeing that it, it. I was able to communicate successfully the thing about the repo def, right? Oh, and, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So for everybody else that that hasn't been deep in this area, um, basically, let's see. Um, when we run these data flows. Um, with, with, okay, so with a data source, right, we iterate over the data source and we say four repos in source dot, you know, with features, and then I give all, you all the repos with those features, right? Um, and that internally calls that source dot repos method, um, which just basically dumps out everything that could be in that data source. Um, so with that, what we do with the data flows is the data flow basically takes uh, inputs of different like a meta definition type of thing. So this thing is a URL, and then you create a, a basically a global variable that says this this is a URL equals definition, and then you know the string representation. So URL and a URL is of data type string. That's like it's primitive, right? And so all of these different all of these um, all of these little blocks here, except for the 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 purple, or let's see, the more pink ones are these input pieces of data, and the more purple ones are like the functions or operations that are getting run. So all of those purple ones, basically, they have, uh, you say what the inputs are, and the inputs are of specific data types, right? And so the package is one of these, you know, it is an input of the package data type. And so we know that when we run this data flow, we, we need a package data type as one of the inputs. Um, so uh, when the way that this works when we're combining it with the sources is that if we want to run a data flow on each entry in a source, right, each repo, uh, what we do is we basically we iterate over all the repos and then we using the data flow run command, you could add a specific input for each repo and you could also add like I believe I'm not sure if it's required or not actually the repo def, but you could basically say, okay, for this uh, unique key, right, which is the uh, which is the repo SRC URL because we still need to rename that. Um, it's I'm going to assign the the key will be the value for some definition, right? Because any input to one of these operations is the value. Right, which would be you know the string representation of the package name in this case, and then it also contains the definition in this input object. So it says, okay, here's the package name, and this input is a package, which is the correct definition. And then when we go to run the data flow, the data flow execution environment says, okay, where's all the things that take an input of definition package? Let me go run those, right? And so that would be this PyPy package JSON and this safety check. Um, and so, uh, basically what's happening now is that we have this concept of subflows, um, so you could run a data flow within a data flow, but to do that, you can't really pass, currently you can't just pass the certain inputs matching definitions directly into that subflow, which would be helpful because then you could just say, okay, like, you know, to kickstart this thing, the first thing I do is I run this subflow, which is the current case with what we're working on. Um, but uh, so that would be great. You could just say any definitions matching, you know, anything that was in that subflow, why don't you just forward it into there and then I'll only wait the top level data flow only will wait for inputs that it understands, right? That's not currently the case of how it works. So we can't just say repo def and then say, okay, you are the definition of the thing in the subflow, uh, which is why we're basically having, we have to go with this approach of merging the data flows to turn them into one thing. Um, and so I think um, from that perspective, right, uh, what, what needs to happen is basically just, is, as long as you remove that, um, or I guess what I'm trying to ask here is, do you know how to test that, right? 
you would you could yeah i okay. i'd remove the data flow then like directly map stuff from the old operation yeah and just uh, merge them and uh, the test case remains the same I yeah guess. yeah exactly okay cool um yeah and i also just wanted to give everybody else sort of a i'm sure that was kind of confusing uh cuz this stuff is wacky um but i wanted to give everybody an overview of what's going on here um cuz the nice the reason why we're doing all of this data flow stuff is because you you can take these models that we're using and then directly combine the data set generation with the model predictions and stuff like that and uh you could you can create arbitrary like okay go do this right like okay i i need you to go collect the feature data given given some input data like a package name i need you to go collect a bunch of feature data and then you're going to actually use that feature data to train it through the model right so when anybody if somebody just gives you a package name now you can go generate all the numbers that are associated with that that would actually let you go put, take that package and run it through a trained model um, so that's the point of this. Um, and yeah, okay. So did what? What else do we need to talk about on that front there? Uh, I guess uh, that's what is now. Like after we finish this, maybe we can talk more about uh, like like forwarding the input to the subflow. Yeah, yeah. I think that that will be key next is doing that input forwarding to the subflow. And I think so. What we're gonna have to do on that is we're gonna have to do sort of like a dive. In to the um, the data flow code, and I don't know if you uh -huh. looked in that memory.py, but I I, I, uh -huh, I looked at that. Yeah. <laughs> it's I wonder. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a crazy crazy. Oh no! Don't open Internet Explorer. No one wants Internet Explorer. Um, so it's a crazy mess. I've seen the code. Like, I tried to understand, but after half of it, I kind of lost it. Yeah. So like I kind of got the overview idea, but. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, like, this is something that I had to like, like. There's there, and there's a few other of these flow frameworks out there right now, but they use they usually use like, sort of the standard, um, you know, they use like MapReduce type of ways of doing things, right? And what's happening here is more of it's it's an event loop, right? It's not it's not like a defined uh, sequence of things. Like this is a event loop that processes arbitrary pieces of data as it comes in. So it's like, okay, how the, how does this work, right? Like, and so let's see, code to comments. Wow, I really thought it was halfway, but no, okay, that's sad. Uh, <laughs> I thought I had 50% comment ratio in there, but I guess not. Um, it is pretty, I feel like it's pretty commented though. Um, okay, okay, all right, okay, that's a lie. Um, yeah, there's some comments. There needs to be more. There needs to be really like a whole write up on this, um, because uh, what's going to happen eventually? Uh, within the documentation because what? Uh, I guess yeah, currently you are the only person who can understand. Yeah, cur currently I'm the only one who like like really understands that deeply. Um, so I need to I need to write that up. But you're definitely the one who's approaching understanding that very quickly. Um, and the other person who really understood that was Arvind, but he hasn't been around for a while. I think he had to he had to go finish up school and get a job, but he had done a lot of stuff on the data flow side of things. Uh, unfortunately, he hasn't had time recently. Um, but so there's, there's like there's like there's like two of us so one one plus one half and one half on the, on the knowledge of this thing i guess i don't i'm not even a one on this thing because it's still very confusing um but i need to write this up um and because the the, the big thing about this is that this runs on one machine right and the thing is all of this stuff runs like uh in it runs concurrently or it could run in parallel if you wanted to run it on like multiple processors or multiple machines and stuff. So one of the things that we want to do eventually is like set up things to listen to like pub sub queues. Like each operation would be listening to a, uh, it would be subscribed to some kind of, you know, distributed queue where it's waiting for its input arguments and then it's publishing to the queue where it's, ex you know, finished results, right? And then you could, what? Auto is uh, like uh, they have yeah that works. Yeah, very similar. Yeah, it's kind of like that's kind of like how ROS works exactly. And what that'll let us do is like it'll let us um, run this stuff on in a distributed setting, um, as well as um, 
let's see. Um, as well as the other thing that, that this lets us do is so we have these operations, right? We also have what's called an operation implementation network. Um, and that's like a network of operation implementations, which are actually the functions themselves, right? And the operations are just like the meta definition of what are the inputs, what are the outputs. So what that allows us to do is um, there's an open issue to basically make that kind of like the sources class where you are accessing uh, all the sources as if it's like one source, right? Um, so there's an open issue to make this operation implementations um, network so that you will access all of these network of implementations as one. And that way you could have um, you could have something like a web server with a open API definition act as uh, a network of implementations. So you could just like point it at this uh, web server that knows how to do you know XYZ things, you map that onto the operation equivalents, and now you you have access to all of those things uh, without having to you know rewrite the Python uh, API code to, act, to call those, right? Um, so it'll let us integrate with other things as well. Um, but that's that's right, it's kind of down the road. That's like the longer term goals for the data flow side of things. Uh, I don't think I told you guys that yet. I I know Yash had been on a while ago when I talked to him. And I let him and Sudarsan know all about that stuff, but I don't, and I know Arvin knew, but I don't think I had told you guys yet. And I haven't gotten the chance to write it all down. So, um, anyway, so let's talk about um, uh, Himanshu. Uh, did you want to talk about, let's see, I think we purged all your stuff recently. You've been really, you've been busy. Um, yeah. So, let's see, how did that. Um, you were working. You were working on the repo dot merge, right? Uh, yeah. I, today I went through all the code, and I think uh, it will really get dirty if I go for the HTTP one, HTTP API. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see? You see what I mean by it's really tricky? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it will be easy for the Python API. Yeah. But for HTTP, it will be really, really messy. Yeah, and that's so, the thing. So what I think. Uh, <laughs> so what I think for now, given my current level of understanding for the mm -hmm. code, uh, let's open the community input for it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I will get back to it a bit later once I understand it better. If no one is doing it. Um, by that time, then I will surely take it up. Okay, but cool. for now, let's open it up for others also. Great, yeah, let's let's jump on that. And then, if you could post your, uh, you know, you had that idea. If you could post like what you said in the chat onto yeah, a comment yeah. here, that'd be great. And that way, anybody who comes on and does decide they want to do it, um, and uh, then they yeah. can they can go for it, right? Uh, they'll have all the ideas. Um, yeah, but yeah, let's see. We could just look at that. Um, service HTTP code real quick. So the thing is, and this is why, this is kind of like what I was talking about with the CLI commands, is this is why it's really important that at, one, at some point, hopefully soon, we can unify all of the all of the configuration stuff to go through those config objects and that config parsing code um, that, that handles those config objects for that base configurable class in base.py. Um, because uh, like this is where when you set that config all caps equals some some config class that's been decorated with that at config, um, we, we figured out how to do all the parsing code to get to figure out all, all the command line options into there, um, and then the other thing is it should be able to successfully load things from files at this point. Um, I don't know, uh, Agen, if you if when you saw it, I don't did I export that and leave it? I can't remember. Um, so what should happen is, so where is that? Um, it is in examples maintained, it should be CGI then. Production data flow. Okay. So this needs to be changed from arg to plugin. But basically, what happens is, if, it, if when it loads config files, it'll also see things that are like in the format of arg, and then the plugin name, and then the config, and it'll successfully like convert this into the config option or the config class class for this plugin type. Um, that is, you know, the database. Um, so 
it, we've got we're, we're to the point where we can like serialize and deserialize pretty much everything except for that we're, we ran into a hiccup with this feature stuff the other day um where for some reason it was like uh uh, if you guys you guys know what a generator is, right? Where you do like you define you create a list like on the fly with like a little for loop or whatever. Um, so for some reason, it was leaving a certain property as a generator, but it wasn't just leaving the property as a generator. It had like set the property to a list with the first element as the actual generator for that list, which was really weird. So we have this like a little hack around that now. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so we need to, we should be at a point where we can kind of serialize and deserialize any of the classes. Um, and so if we can figure out at some point how to unify that, that um, config code, that would, make things like you know it would make things like this easier right because the thing is right with the cli commands um they don't use that config that auto config stuff right so it's all defined with the arg whatever um and then it goes through a separate config parsing path and the that once you get to the point where you're loading these objects that are that have configs the loading is all consistent, right? But at that top level, it's different. And what you ran into, of course, is that at the top level of the HTTP service, it's also different, right? So the sooner we can get like whatever that top level is unified somehow, that will really greatly simplify things. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how we do that or at what timeline we do that, um, but I, it's sort of just something where somebody needs to go spend some time on like, okay, how does this work? And uh, you know, it's 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 going to be a, a sort of bang your head against the wall task, but the result is we're going to run into way less issues because we won't be hitting uh, you know weird. It'll be it's easier to change things and add things when it's all just a property of some class, right? Um, it becomes way easier to modify stuff throughout the code base without doing massive refactors. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Um, I guess, and then anything and, uh, else? Yeah, so other than that, leaving it behind for now. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, uh, I'm thinking of, like, uh, I'm not sure what should I do first. So mm -hmm. one thing is, uh, we can add more models in scikit-learn, okay? Yeah. But uh, that, there are a few things, like, we are not opening, uh, giving all the, uh, we are not opening up our API fully. I am thinking because yeah. all we have is train, predict, and fit, right? But oh, there are yeah. so many more functions yeah. that we need, especially if you go for unsupervised thing. Uh -huh. Okay, and so maybe I was thinking we can open it up so like we can access all the functions, if not all for now, at least few more. Okay, and um, that is one point. Then the other point was for accuracy thing. So yeah, it's a very simplification. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we should uh, we should give user a pre give give him chance to pass like what he wants in accuracy. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, that's it, good it should idea. not be a predefined thing. Uh -huh. That second point, I'm I'm not sure what should I do first. And the third point is, um, I've been working on side by side on the TensorFlow pre-trained models. Mm -hmm. Okay, so oh, you've I been working that on that. Yeah, oh, I've great, been working on great, that. yeah, a TensorFlow hub. So for now, I cannot do for images because obviously Saksham is uh, doing that image thing. Yeah. So for text, uh, I can do that. Okay, so what okay. should I do first? Um, you mean like natural language processing and stuff? Yeah, because uh, if you see on the TensorFlow Hub, then you, we have three options for pretend models for now. So yeah. One is for videos, uh, one is for text, and the other one is for images. Yeah. So yeah, images and videos are for now not for us. Yeah, say. so text, but we can go ahead with that. Uh -huh. So should I do that? Oh yes, yes definitely. definitely. That would be really cool. Um, I think yeah, I think that would be super helpful. And so I think one of the things is with this, um, with the pre-trained models, obviously there's going to be no. I don't. I don't. I'm. I'm I'm not sure if you can do like further training on them. I haven't really investigated no, that we'll much. Have, uh, yeah, we'll have to do further training because they are trained for a particular reason, and we want, we may want to tweak them. So it's like yeah. just adding one or two layers. 
mm-hmm. on that so it's it's a very simple trend uh, okay. we can turn on simple laptops <laughs> only gpus and all for that great yeah. yeah okay so this sounds yeah this sounds awesome um i guess i don't really know much of what direction to give you here i think you kind of uh probably have a good idea it's you know it's same type of stuff that was in scikit um especially since you actually had to go implement the other um sort uh model context you're probably pretty familiar with you know how this is going to go now um but basically you know you do the same sort of format right and if you want something that's a little more slim down to use it as a reference well i mean i guess the tensorflow classes if you are in model tensorflow itself um you'll see you know the input functions and stuff the one thing is that um the one thing is that obviously that is using the one point uh something api the 1.0 api um, and if you wanted to move to the 2.0 API, you'd have to change the rest of TensorFlow uh, code, right? Um, and I know that I know that that's happened. What it was like over the winter here, like slightly before that. Um, but that would be that. I mean, it depends. You know, if that's going to make your life a lot easier, then I would say you might want to, you know, do that first. Um, move to the 2.0 API first. Yeah, 2.0 will be better because uh, yeah. if you see on the website, they recommend using 2.0 because they are shifting everything. To them. Yeah, and I so noticed we're starting to get a lot of different things. We're just supporting that only, so it's good if we move to 2.0. Yeah, sweet. So yeah, if you, uh, if you're, I think, and I think the API, APIs are, are, you know, hopefully, when I was doing the 1.0 stuff initially, this is, I, it was a while ago when I first implemented this code. I think it was like almost three years ago now. Um, so and the, as you'll notice, like all the APIs are, are it's 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 kind of weird. Um, the way that you interact with TensorFlow is pretty weird. Um, and I think they've made it a lot a lot better. But if you run into issues, then of course you know we'll just try to try to figure that out. Um, and so yeah, basically I would say yeah, if if all of that stuff is very 2.0 focused, then yeah, definitely try to figure out how to switch the existing code to 2.0 as the first. Uh, thing, and then once you switch the existing okay. code to 2.0, I mean, there's, there's only the two models in there, and I think at least yeah. one of the functions for training input data is derived for they're the same. Um, so hopefully that that goes smoothly. If not, you know, me and Rupal can definitely uh, give some pointers on that. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, so first thing I will move to 2.2 and then I will go for pretend yes, website. Exactly. And I think okay. the other thing is that, you know, if you're going to do uh, those applicable features methods, um, those right now, you're, you're just going to need to make sure to override right. that. Uh, there was, it, it, with the existing API, uh, we could have easily added the string data type in there and done one of those, like, uh, what was that, like hash, hash bins or something for the column. Um, to basically add string all they were doing was they were like transparently hashing string values and then assigning them to an integer value uh and doing like a a look up and reverse look up when they needed to um but it just made it transparent so that you could throw string values in there um i don't know exactly what your text processing stuff will be doing um because i'm not super familiar with that uh but you may obviously it, that applicable features method if you derive from the same class is going to uh, it's going to not let through any features that are not of the applicable data types that it doesn't filter out right okay. um, but you might that might end up changing anyways when you go to the 2.0 api yeah. and you have to do different things defining the columns or whatever i don't know how they do it in the 2.0 api so yep yeah cool um so and then so let's say you're gonna we'll work on M- nlp uh for um TensorFlow. for tensorflow yeah. um and then pre-trained models. yeah tensorflow pre-trained models and then you were also talking about giving the user the option to select uh, what accuracy means with scikit models yeah okay and so let's open an issue for this um so that's that's you know we want to track that um all right so model scikit um 
Oh, and I was able to successfully demo the whole project to somebody over the weekend. It was the first time I actually got to give a live demo. I've given a presentation before, but but this is the first time somebody said, hey, can we use your thing for that? Um, and I was able to, you know, pull it down and be like, pip install, everything worked, and then we ran it on their data, and, uh, you know, it actually got 90% accuracy, so we were like, ah, great, you know, we were using, I think, one of the scikit, uh, one of the scikit models. Um, so that was really awesome, right? It was like, oh, you know, success we can pull down this thing and people can use it for machine learning that really don't understand much other than knowing how to use the command line and and you know export their cs excel files to csv so that, that was big win right there it was exciting to see um yeah and i was really i was also you know you know what really made my weekend was when you said uh Augen, when you said that it was exciting to see all the stuff come together in the data flow that was like that was really fun to hear um because that is like exactly what we're going for you know it's like you throw all this stuff in there what they're like the data flow thing was kind of yeah exactly right it's like oh shit okay all of this stuff is gonna run and i'm not sure where it's what's gonna happen and if you if you screw it up sometimes it just sort of loops and it dispatches all of these operations and you just get a million of them running at the same time <laughs> uh, yeah it can be it can be a little nerve-wracking but it's really cool when it runs and it's just like okay i did all of this stuff at the same time for you enjoy like <laughs> it's great um Let's see. So give the user the option to select what they want. I'm going to add an issue for this. Um, and then, all right, great. Yeah, and we got those clustering models in. I want to go use those myself. I want to see how that works. That's going to be fun. Um, let's see. Is there anything else anybody wanted to yeah. talk about? I tried it on Gitpod and it's still giving the same. Error. Oh, yeah, that's right. Can we check that out? I'm really sorry. It's hey, no error. worries. No I worries. Let me, I'm going to get my Git pod re going here too. We got to be able to fix these type of issues because this is like the wacky development environment stuff that always comes up. Uh -oh. Oh. All right. Okay. Damn. No repos to train on again. Okay. So let's see. Okay. Um, and what happens, ooh, okay, here's a test. What happens if we take that, um, I wonder if this is documented in the doc stuff, so uh, check out um, IDX3 source docs usage MNIST. Did I document, did we document the uh, list command here? Uh, it doesn't look like we did. Um, oh, if you I think I have that. Yeah. Let's try that list command, and then you can, you know, do the head and whatever to cut it off. Ah, see here, it's doing the same thing. It looked like that was list. Um, yeah, that one. List repos. Yeah, grab that, and let's see. And you're going to need to obviously cut off those uh, little carrots at the front there. Here, do that uh, control X um, E. Yeah, and then you can get rid of those guys easier. Uh, that reminds me, I need to set the editor to Vim. Or, well, I guess not everybody likes Vim. I shouldn't set the editor to Vim. <laughs> Somebody will open the editor and get pot and be like, oh crap, now I can't exit. Uh, so I was just trying to run the code. I got an entry point not found. Uh, you made some changes, right? Did you push that? Okay. Uh, let's see. We're not merging the label thing with the image feature. Okay, it's not merging. Wait. Uh, so, okay, yeah, it's still not merging. What the hell is up with that? Um, so, our Agen, uh, sorry, what branch are you talking about? Uh, so, like, I was just trying to run Sautron's branch. And I just ran the commands you put up in Gitter, 
so I'm getting an entry point from there. Sure. Can you try so, pulling the branch again? Because I think, uh, or well, oh, if you're getting entry point not found, you have to install the source. Sorry. So that's that is. Um, uh, DFFML service uh, dev install. Yeah. Dev service install. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, that one will work. Or if you just want to install it one off, you can do um, the pip install dash e source idx. And then obviously with the prefix or not equals. Yeah, I started just saying everybody should install to dot local because um, the user flag sometimes doesn't work, I noticed. And then. Um, and then um, also, yeah, installing globally is a mess. The user flag sometimes doesn't work, so that prefix seems to work more than not. So I just put that everywhere in the docs. Um, so let's see. All right, and then, yeah, let us know if that works. And let me open up my Git pod here. It's, why is it still loading? All right, there we go. Okay. Alright, um I'm gonna run it in my get pod too, and then if anybody else let's see. Um hang yeah, out here, I'll share mine too. Where you can see what I'm doing. Um, yeah, you and I'm getting the same error. You're getting the same error? Okay, let's see if I get it here. If I get if I then there's just something weird about me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think you've done something uh, with your machine. Yeah, Magic I must box. have done something. No, <laughs> okay, you got no repos to train on. Hey, at least it's consistent now. All right, okay, what the hell is wrong with my machine then that it works? No, no I don't feel left out. Yeah, okay, great. I'm glad we have more people validate, and I did it on GamePod. I was sure when I ran it in Docker, I was like, oh, this will have to isolate it. Um, but I guess not. Um, okay, but this is really weird, right? Because, because it's... I hell? think the repos dot merge thing doesn't work. Yeah, it's not well. Yeah, it's not working for some reason. So source ID or I'll just do it right now. All right, come on. Give me a show. All right. Um. So vim dffml source. You guys can see my screen, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. I, um, I put tmux into, into the, the GitHub environment, environment because I noticed that they give a full shell and I don't, I don't have to use their editor. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, so I think the first step here will be to just say self logger debug. So let's just check what are these other sources that, that we're, we're supposed, supposed to be merging now. with. Um, okay. Turn IDX3, it's loading all that data. Um, yeah, it should print that a lot. Okay, it didn't print that at all. Wait a minute. Logger.debug. Other sources blank. All right, well, well that's no, no good, good right there. there. Um, uh, I uh, saw the length of self is two, so it should have that one colon. Uh, it should have something there. Okay. So 
let's cast this to a list again and just make sure. All right. Yeah, that's odd. Okay, so that, I mean, that explains it, though, because if for some reason it's for source in self, and this is the async context manager list context. Ay, ay, ay. Let's go. Oh, God damn it. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, and I made it once through the. No, that's right. Yeah, okay. Wow, I am so confused at why it works on my machine. That is really weird. Okay. Um. Expected most one arguments got two. Why? Why would you expect it most one arguments? Oh. I'm giving you. Okay, whatever. Maybe it's because of that. Just, just tell us what's going on. Okay, and, and everybody, if you guys don't want to, uh, if you guys have other things to do or sleep to get, don't feel the need to stay on the call. Um. Oh, I want to know what's happening. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so other sources too. What the fuck? Okay. I think the second source is just an empty list. Yeah. Oh, that could. Yeah, that could be. That could be. Let's see. So, let's try this here because it's was saying. Okay. Oh, fun. Uh, the IDX one source, I think, needs some changing. If that's the case. Yeah, but the thing is, the thing is, it, it's not. Let's see, self dot logger at debug. The thing is, it loads this IDX three source, the image uh, arrays, but it is not loading the label uh, int array. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Source IDX. If I'm also sorry, IDX, IDX1. Looks right. Loaded, wait, but it says loaded percent, D, yeah, okay. But it's printing out that it loaded at 60,000 records. So, merging with, oh. right, so something's wacky there. Is it not a parsing or something like that? Uh, we could try printing it out to see what the hell is going on there. Like, if it's parsing that stuff correctly. I mean, I kind of assume it is. I think it's a problem with this method here, because um, I bet you if you listed the one source and then you listed the other source, it would show up correctly if you listed them one by one. But I guess we should try that. Okay. Oh, this is going to probably create a problem for my machine. Um... Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Okay, yeah, so... Okay, that's a problem. Uh, uh, okay, jeez. All right, well, I'm going to have 60,000 of... Okay, there we go. All right, so this self one is zero all of a sudden. So what happens if we do... Okay, let's do this here. And then let's do... I swear I tested this. It's probably self to zero is what it's supposed to be, but I swear I tested it and it was supposed to be self one. But it should be one. It starts from the uh, the number. Yeah, from the number you give. Yeah. Okay. okay. Self to zero. Wait a minute. Okay, this is what's going on. When we slice this list for some reason, I wonder if it has to do with my version of Python and they fixed something. What version am I on? Python 3.7 version. Oh. Okay, 3.7.3 Python 3.7 version 7.6 I bet you uh, I have 
You, yeah, and I have 3.7.3. Either I was relying on a bug, or there is a bug now, because this is obviously working on my machine and not working on 3.7.6. So, and this is also, but the other thing is that this async context manager list context, God, that is a long class name. I apologize. Uh, it's what it is. <laughs> um, uh, async helper. So, okay, and it's a user list. Damn, okay, I really thought that that was going to be the issue here. Um, why can't we, why can't we access it like that? What the hell? Um, for item himself dot parent. Does the user list have a property? I think user list has some property. Okay, data, the real list object. All right, let's try this. I bet this, this will probably fix it up. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, check this out. You see this here, and then this user list dot init. Okay, self dot append. Ah, oh, no. Okay, so that should be fine too. Damn it. Um, or maybe we should be doing like self dot data dot append. Because if this, oh, that's right. I'm git pod now. All right. So it's saying that data is the real list object. Um, so maybe if we append a data, it will be happy. Um, and we get from data. So let's just change all this to data and see if it's happy with us. Um, so the data dot append, and then here, and then let's change this back to one. I have a feeling that this is part of it. I don't know. Let's see. This is odd. Music list. Hmm. Still not correct. What is up with that? Because uh, what happens if we just do like source in self? What if we happens if we cut self dot data then? Because if that's the underlying list, like This is weird. This is a super weird bug. Unless it's like something else entirely, which it quite possibly could be. But I honestly, I don't know because that's like, there we go. You have to do source.data. Look at that. You guys see that? Let's see. Cool. So this is a bug then. This is a bug. It's not my, it's not our, our bug, bug though. That's what that. That's what I take this to mean, because if that worked in point three and now it doesn't work and we have to access by self that data, I call. I actually I, call I have uh, three point seven point four. You have three point seven point four. And uh, it's I think it only works on three point seven point three and uh, before that. Let's see if this works now. With uh, I mean, I just changed self that data so. Ha! It's got to be a 3.7.3. .3. Either it's a bug with the ones after 3.7.3, .3, or it's a bug with 3.7.3. .3. Ha! Python yeah, bug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
I know. It's, it's like what never happens. It's like it's always you think it's a bug in somebody else's code, and then it's a bug in your code. But no, this time it's somebody else's code. It's not our code. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow, that was enjoyable. All right. Well, yeah, I'm sure you guys are glad you you didn't go to sleep now. <laughs> uh, all right, sweet. Okay, well, let's just do the, let's just do that then, and let's make a note of this. So in Python 3.7.3, uh, self one works in Python uh, greater than 3.7.3, only self data works. Um, Uh, will it work for the CSV files too? Like, uh, it'll work for everything. Yeah. So this will work for everything. Um, because this is this is basically right. This is where the generic abstraction stuff comes in. Um, because this is this is the part right here. This sources class is what's abstracting all of the the backend data sources, whether it be CSV or JSON or whatever. So all sources will now be fixed, right? If you if you combined like a MySQL database and a CSV source, um, then it all it should all be fixed at this point, unless I interpreted your question wrong. No, I meant that. Okay. okay. All right. So and then and then let's go see if this is a reported bug. So. Uh, user list uh, open. Uh, okay, three point five, three point seven. Um, no, this isn't doing a copy. All right, we found a bug, I think. Um, user list. Um, get item doesn't account for slices, or maybe this is already reported. Aha! Returns a list, not a user list. 2016. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay, everything on this one is complete. Issue may be closed. Maybe this is where they screwed it up, because this I feel like this is this is around the time that I got I pulled that new version of Python. Uh, anyways, it's not super important. We'll see if it's still in uh, correct return type for slicing operation. Yeah, so it's updated. I, huh? I don't know. We should see if it's in three point eight. I guess. Let's just make a note. Um, and then this is the new issue for the models. It would be multiple things, add a property to config to let user decide what they want it to mean. All right, and then let's put this, let's see, this is kind of like, you know, this is like average. Um, and then, I now know. that the bug, uh, this bug is fixed, uh, you uh, uh, you talked uh, you wanted to talk about the ideas like on the mnist.rst file. You oh yeah yeah yeah. I guess that would be this would be a good time, time to talk about, about that. that. Yeah. Um. So let's see. That's uh, what uh, ne uh, is next. What's to be done, right? Okay. Let's see. Um. Yeah. So what's next here is um. Okay, and let, let's just let's, let's just see, see uh, what, what just, just happened, happened here. here. Uh, let's before we call it declare success, let's do get diff, um, <laughs> and actually um, apply this. So because I'm working in the um, okay, let me go let me go copy paste this into my thing that has access to actually like you know make changes. Um, Okay, so okay, uh, okay, great. So 
hotfix for uh, async context manager list slice. Okay. Now, hopefully that works. I mean, if it works in GitPod, I, I would assume it works everywhere else. So, um, docs, usage, amnest. All right, so did I have the, okay, this is the Docker stuff. Okay. Um, okay, pre-processing, right? Is that what you were talking about? Yeah, yes. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that this, so I said this stuff about pre-processing, I ran the model train and it actually came out okay. Um, but I saw a lot of people talking about MNIST and doing pre-processing to scale, um, you know, to, to do uh, uh, normalization, right? Um, yeah, you did the normalization, but then you removed it. Yeah, I removed it. Actually, that may have been when the accuracy was good. I may be confused. Um, so, because when I got it without the normalization, I remember I was getting like 60% accuracy, and then I feel like I trained it one time and it was 90%. But that's what happens with neural networks is sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So I, I might have just chalked it up to that. But that may not be true, right? Um, so the thing is, what we really need long term is uh, we need to create a source that is like the, it'll be under the entry point of pre-process or something. Um, and then we would say like that, that source itself would take a source. And then when it's iterating, um, it would do some pre-processing on the feature data. Um, and actually this may be something where, uh, yeah, I think it, it might be, should probably be per source. Um, we might want to do it at the sources level, or we might want to do it at the source level. That's kind of that's a that's an open question right now. Um, but so, yeah, what what we'd want to do is we'd want to create this source where, as it's iterating through all the entries in it, um, it pr it does some pre-processing, right? And to start with, uh, the initial idea would be um, just do like you could specify, okay, for this feature that you're getting out of this source, I want you to like apply this pre-processing, which would be something like run this specific operation, right? And then you would say um, use the um, use the feature data as you know whatever the input to. So for example, the array divide operation might take two inputs, right? It might be like you know the array and then the uh, number to divide it by. Right, right, like, like everything, everything in the rate gets divided by this number, right? For this case, it would be the normalization. Yeah, so like this would be, or I guess array normalized would be the right, the right word for this operation, right? And so then you might say something like, actually, I think I figured out what the syntax for this would be. Um, so it would be like source feature, um, so the images, um, and then something like, this is where I was talking about the user dict mapping. Um, so, or sorry, the dict mapping. I think I put that in a comment somewhere. But basically, what we need to do is add to config parsing uh, code uh, a way to do um, dict um, stir some class mapping. Um, and what that'll let us do is basically we can say like images, so source, so this would be like, um, this will just be the dict for now, right? Just to illustrate the fact that that's what's going on here. And then image, and then we do like, so image uh, operation would be array norm, normalize and then you do like um feature um feature to input um and then this would be like the input name input name array or feature data goes to right does that make sense so basically we'd say like this would start creating a dict Right, and so this would be the dict, right? And then image is the key, op is the property within the new class that is of type subclass, some class, 
and so there's some within subclass some class there's the property op and then there's probably like um there's probably like another one of these dict mappings where we're starting mapping feature input names um so like ah feature input uh, names like can you give me, can you give me an example uh I, can, I i will have to later i actually have to run now um but i okay, will we can try talk to do that later, later if you if you don't have the time uh, yeah. we can talk later okay great let's do that so it'll probably be tomorrow for me but um so let's see uh so let me push this up Docs. okay all right i will see you guys um have a great night and uh, thanks for working this all out. This is great. And let me know if there's anything we missed on Gitter then. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Goodbye.